Hi, it's Mark Cooper Smith with your latest episode on the resilient entrepreneur building success and surviving setbacks based on our book that John and I wrote, The Other F Word, How Smart Leaders, Teams, and Entrepreneurs Put Failure to Work. So let's jump into our next area, which is, let me share screen with you, which is fear and memory. And as you can see in our table of contents, that takes us to chapter five. So we're at chapter five in the book and fear and memory of failure, we call failures force multipliers. And why is that? Remember, we've already shared with you that failure happens all the time, whether it's Michael Jordan missing more shots or than he made or the 70% or more of startups that fail in the first 18 or 24 months, failure happens all around. and since it happens all around us, why is it so difficult for organizations and leaders to address? Why don't we just say, as we talked about earlier, failures like gravity, it happens all the time, let's get used to it. And the more we wanna innovate, the more new things we try, the more we have to recognize there will be setbacks. Not everything, especially when we try new things, will work out the way that we thought it would. So why is it so difficult for our organizations and for our leaders to address? Well. There are a number of area of reasons why, and some of this comes to psychology. And that's why one of the reasons I really wanted to do this particular session is the psychology element of it. Brief aside, my father was a psychologist and he focused on self-esteem. Um, he passed away when I was a teenager. So it's been a long time since he and I had a chance to talk about any of these issues, but he wrote some of the seminal books around self-esteem. He studied with Maslow of hierarchy of needs, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And he focused on those issues. And as we were, John and I were researching this book, I went back to some of my father's research and some of it I really read with a fresh eye. And coming out of this, especially as we think about self-esteem, one of his key takeaways from the research he did was that, and let me get this right, he said that fear of failure is the best predictor of failure. And we can flip that around, and there's a kind of a current way we might say it, as you've heard, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're probably right. So fear of failure is the best predictor, which means if you're afraid you're going to fail, you're gonna step back, you're gonna reset your expectations and you have a much higher percentage of failing. We also can take a look at that when it comes to, for example, the way athletes perform. You know, many athletes fail more often than they succeed. We already talked about basketball players and Michael Jordan. What about baseball players? Where a great batting average is in the 300s, which means you fail twice as often as you succeed in getting a hit at the plate. My son played baseball, um, and whenever he would strike out or make an out, what would, his co what would his coach tell him? He would say, flush it, Matt, and come up the next time confident that you're going to get a hit because that's the way you succeed. And there's a lot around sports psychology that's tied up in this as well. But when we think about it from an organizational standpoint, why is it so difficult to address? Well, it's this issue of memory. Remember when we introduced it, it was fear and memory, failures force multipliers. And think about a big failure. We've talked about that a little bit in the episode so far. And if you think about it, when John and I ask people, they often can come up with a big failure from 10 years ago or more. And they just say, look, those big failures, we remember them so well. People kind of curl up into a little bit of an emotional fetal position because the memory is sharp and it has a very long half-life, right? So when you think about that, you say, I do not want to experience that failure again. That was very painful. And when you have that memory that's painful and you don't want to experience it again, you establish this cycle, this destructive cycle that is this fear and memory of failure, but this fear of failure, right? So that it won't happen again. Well, there are times when maybe that's healthy. Like if you put your hand over a hot flame and burn yourself once, you won't do that again. 
because you've learned from that. But there are other times when we talk about taking chances in business, trying new things, going back to something that didn't work out last time, and maybe there was something we learned, let's try that again. So we have a particular exercise, and we want to kind of conclude, I want to conclude this session with what this exercise is that you as an entrepreneur, as a business leader can undertake. And I'll share with you a case study of how we put that to work. So the exercise goes like this. If you're at a point where you feel you're a little stuck, I want you to ask yourself or ask your colleagues this question. What would you do if you knew that it would not fail? And to be a little more realistic, because we know sometimes things will fail, or that you knew you wouldn't or your colleagues wouldn't pay a career limiting price if it did. That if it did fail, we knew that we were taking a chance on it. Would you come up with more interesting and provocative ideas? And in most cases, the answer is yes. So before we wrap up, I wanna share a story with you. I'll stop sharing here. Of a large drug company and the CEO, a few weeks after we held this activity was due to present to his board of directors and he wanted to bring some really innovative ideas out there. And he'd asked his leadership team to present their best ideas and he thought that they were still a bit conservative. So we gathered the top 50 executives in this um, pharmaceutical company and we broke up into a number of different groups and we posed them the following question. Same question I just asked you, what would you do if you knew it wouldn't fail? Or even if it did, that there would be no career blowback, so no career limiting move for you. And at the end of the day, these executive teams came up with really innovative ideas. Now they were riskier ideas, but they were really innovative. Um, and the CEO, when we presented the ideas at the end of the day said, where have these been? These been? And in most cases, those ideas had been inside the executives' minds or they'd been turning them over within their teams for some time. But as one of them very succinctly put it, he said, I love my job at this company. I'm not sure I wanted to put forward something so risky that it might put my career at risk. And the executive said, look, if we don't take chances, CEO said, if we don't take these types of chances, we're putting all of our careers at risk. So they took those ideas, presented them to the board, a number of them got greenlit, and that can, company now uses this as a regular activity to come up with those different types of ideas. So I want you to keep that in mind. Next time, maybe you're stuck or you're a little bit afraid, uh, you're a little concerned about what if I might do that? And the final way I'd like to frame it is, think about what entrepreneurs here in Silicon Valley do. Right? They know that seven or eight out of 10 of their startups might fail. As a result, they're okay taking risks. Investors are okay investing in entrepreneurs that have had some failures along the way. But in particular, when we can learn from those failures, that's where the biggest ideas come from. All right, that's it for now. See you soon.